Uh, sorry, I was a little late. Uh, I was stuck in the lunch line, so. <laughs> So sorry about that. Um, so seriously, I'm really excited to uh, share our journey with Degreed today. And so um, what I wanted to go through is a couple things. One, I wanted to kind of uh, take kind of a different, you know, in, instead of just giving you an overview of what we've done with Degreed and the project, I wanted to go through kind of a slightly different lens, no pun intended. Um, I wanted to look at how we did things a little bit differently in the Degreed project. And so just for background, we're about to launch Degreed in two weeks. So um, this, everything I would talk about is in relation to our pilot. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how we thought about our strategy slightly differently than maybe traditional L&D team does. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about how we inserted some new team DNA, um, some, some roles that traditionally aren't part of the L&D team. And then finally, I wanted to talk through some things we did from a technology perspective. And then we'll have Casey come back on and go into a moderated Q&A. Uh, but before that, I wanted to set a little bit of backdrop. So I think all of us in the room have been talking about the future of L&D for some time. And it feels kind of like this. Um, where we've been talking about it so much, but we haven't been making measurable moves towards the future of L&D. And so at Cisco, we're no different, but the Degree Project actually provided us a unique opportunity to, to try new things, test new concepts, try new roles. Um, and so that's really what I wanted to share with you today. And I think Einstein says it best that we can't solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So uh, that's what we took to heart. So um, in terms of how we needed to think differently, it's along, again, three main areas. So our strategy, our teams, and our technology. So from a strategy perspective, before I go into what we did differently, I want to give you some ideas of some of the challenges we are facing at Cisco. So like many of you in the crowd, um, we are challenged with the half-life of skills. So the idea that there's a shelf life for your skill set. I think the last time I read, it said around five years. And in some areas like artificial intelligence, it's 12 to 18 months. So how, with all the things that are changing, how we're gonna keep our employees you know, updated, relevant, and helping drive the business. In addition, we're focused on some key critical talent pools that we're trying to develop over the next couple of fiscal years. Um, and so these are in very hot areas, much like probably you guys are going after as well. So that was another challenge. Third challenge is kind of a result of the prior two, which is, hey, we're trying to build this new talent pool. We're trying to deal with the half-life of skills. So upskilling and reskilling are a huge challenge for us at Cisco. And then finally, I guess this would be the result of all of them, is that we at Cisco, we needed to build this new muscle around continual learning. Um, this, it's no longer okay to say, hey, I went to the Lens conference and took a presentation course. That's my development for the year. Um, we can't do that anymore. We have to be learning new things on an ongoing basis. In addition to these business challenges, we had some learning challenges as well. So Today within Cisco, I would say 80 to 85% of the learning is occurring outside the walls of Cisco. So outside the walls of our LMS, um, happening places like YouTube or TED or Pluralsight, et cetera. Um, so no one is waking up in the morning with their cup of joe and, and logging into the LMS to learn. So no one's doing that. If you are, raise your hand. <laughs> Because of this, one of the main issues is our learning platform. It doesn't facilitate this type of learning. Um, so, you know, our typical LMS doesn't support this kind of on-the-go learning or, um, you know, access to different outside content. In addition, we had an issue with mobile learning. It's now the primary device in which people are consuming content and our systems did not support it. And then finally, because of because of the way people were learning, 
They would have to go to the sales system for sales training. They'd have to go to the LMS for leadership training. They would go to YouTube or all the external sites. And it really created a fragmented experience. So traditionally, what we would do is just take those learning challenges and take it to you know, our senior leaders and say, this is the reason why we need a new learning platform, because of these challenges. But we did something different this time. We tied it to both the business challenges that I showed you before and the learning challenges. And so what that creates is a much more powerful uh, case, if you will, and it's easier to articulate that value to HR leaders, to business leaders. Instead of saying, hey, we need this new learning tool, you say, hey, we need a platform to develop and keep our employees relevant to drive the business. The second thing I wanted to walk through is the evolution of the L&D team at Cisco and how this played into the DeGreed project. So, like many of you, I'm sure your teams have many of these roles. Uh, so we'll start from the left. Uh, the instructional designer, you know, traditionally focuses on content design, content development. But with a system in place where people, employees can go and learn anything at any time, there's no need to create as much. So what do the instruction, instructional designers do? Well, there is gonna be a situation where we do wanna design net new content. And because there's all this great high quality content out there, what you produce internally has to be even better than that. It has to be a really meaningful learning experience. And so that's where we see the, the user experience designer kind of becoming the next instructional designer. The program manager, we like to call this the uh, Swiss Army knife of L&D roles. They do a little bit of everything, uh, do a little bit of uh, curriculum design, they do a little bit of this, a little bit of marketing. But what we found is, it, if you're gonna get your message out there to the world uh, about this new platform, and you're gonna really want to make the change happen, you need someone who's a full-time marketing person on your team. And I'll share an example of what we did in the pilot and what we're planning to do with the launch. At Cisco, we have a lot of people focused on managing curriculums and designing them and maintaining them. Um, but again, because we're in the situation where the, the world is flooded with high quality content, we really see the need for, uh, for that role to evolve to a curator. And so me and Casey will talk a little bit more about what we did from a curation perspective or what we are doing. Finally, most of your teams probably have some person or a series of people that have manage a tool, manage the LMS, manage the LCMS, et cetera. Everybody has a person like that on their team. However, because technology and learning is becoming so intertwined, um, we're really starting to see the need for uh, the role of a software developer on, uh, on a learning team. So to give you an example of how one of these roles plays out in the pilot, I wanted to go down the marketing route. So traditionally, and I've been, uh, I, I should have introduced myself properly, but I've been in sales l and I've led the engineering l and function at Cisco. Um, I'm now part of the leadership and team intelligence team, which builds and designs all the le learning experiences for leaders and teams. And our traditional approach to marketing was identify the target audience, then build the, the wonderful marketing email, and then blast it out to everyone. Now, how many people are familiar with this approach or have used it in the past? All right. It's great. I mean, it's, it has its time and use. Um, but we, in the degree pilot, we did something different. So the first thing we did is it started with a strategy. So this idea that we want to market, not a learning tool, but a platform that's going to enable things, career development, upskilling, et cetera. So we started with that, and we built a campaign around that. And so the way we did that is we actually created three different routes to market, and we tested it with employees. In the pilot, we actually uh, came up with a campaign around limitless learning. 
And it was, it was an email-based campaign because it was just the pilot. Um, but we threw that away. Um, and that's what you have to do uh, with marketing. You always have to be launching something new. So we threw that away, went back to the drawing board, and came up with three new routes. Uh, one of them uh, was interesting, and it hit, I think, a little too close to home. It, it called for little robot cardboard things to be around the office and saying and having all the sorts of world economic forums uh, quotes like uh, if you're entering kindergarten today you know whatever it is 50% of the jobs will be different when you graduate high school but that kind of hit too close to home so that didn't really <laughs> resonate well with people <laughs> so in the end um, we, we found something that really worked and we're gonna start rolling out and prep for uh, and prep for the launch uh, coming up on October 16th. It's a mystery campaign, so, uh, so we're gonna be sending out signals to, to get people interested. So in, in addition to this, you don't stop with just launching the campaign via email. You have to do it through multiple channels. So we're gonna be doing it through digital signage, through print and digital media, um, you know, posters and the much like the degree event today, where, where there's posters everywhere, there's advertising, there's imagery, et cetera, and that's what we're gonna do. Now, there's gonna a lot of effort. We're lucky to have a creative team on our L&D team, it's awesome. But this one launch isn't gonna make and drive the lasting change that's necessary. Um, so what we need to do is to continually, continually reinforce the, the messaging by continuing to launch new campaigns to drive further adoption, to build that memory muscle around continual learning and to help change the culture. The second example um, I wanted to provide was around uh, something that's very close to my heart, which is technology. I'm a geek, I'll, I'll admit it. Uh, but you know what, most L&D professionals aren't technical in nature. Um, and what I found is, uh, at least at Cisco, I found that people tend to s stay away from technology. And what I'm gonna s hypothesize here is that that needs to change. Again, because, because learning and, and, uh, and technology are so intertwined, we can't, we have to embrace it. I'm not saying everyone needs to become a coder, but we have to be conversational in it. We need to be comfortable with it and we need to embrace it. So one of the things, again, we're lucky at Cisco to have some software developers on my L&D team. And so what they did is we had this interesting challenge at Cisco where we have a bunch of learning systems that are behind the firewall. So no cloud-based systems where it's easy to connect. You'd have to poke a hole in the firewall. It's a security nightmare, et cetera. So uh, these two software developers on my team went ahead and built what we call the catalog service. They actually call it Borg, because it assimilates catalog information, but I guess, yeah. So anyways, resistance is futile. Um, <laughs> so what happens is basically the catalog service, and it's actually something called a microservice. It's a microservice is just like a soft piece of software that does one thing really well. And so what it does using a combination of Python scripts and APIs is it goes out and checks in our LMS, in our sales system, in our certification catalog and sees, did something change? Was something added, deleted, or updated? And that takes that information and compares it what's within the catalog service, which is basically a replica of, hey, we know this is in Degreed. And then it sends the update via Degreed's API um, to, uh, on a daily basis. It can be altered, you can do it every four hours, every two days, et cetera. You can use a Excel spreadsheet, you can use APIs, so it's a really um, adaptable and flexible model. In addition, uh, we used it for our completion data uh, that's being sent from our LMS because if you wanna send completions to degree, it has to be a live course in degree. So what happens is our developers just built another endpoint, API endpoint, and so the IT integration first checks the catalog system. Is the course in there? Yes, if so, I'll send the completion information to Degreed. If no, don't send. So I guess the, the thing I would wrap up with here is that, again, 
Let's embrace technology as L&D professionals. With the influx of all this new stuff, AI, machine learning, we need to get a handle on it. Um, so, so with that, I, I'll ask Casey to come back up and we'll chat a little bit more about this. Hi, hey, Josh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so first things first, uh, Josh will be selling Borg here this afternoon. No. Um, so fantastic. Thanks, Josh, for sharing this. I think, um, you know, one of the things that was, uh, you know, when we started these conversations uh, you know, with you, it was uh, you guys started with this four-letter word to salespeople, customer experience people. You said, we're going to have a proof of concept, <laughs> um, which is like the worst thing you want to hear, right? Because uh, they're hard. I think what was really great about what you guys have done is you were very, uh, you were very intentional about your proof of concept and what that meant. Um, and it wasn't about testing degree, it was a, a different mindset. So your whole team took a different approach to the proof of concept. Can you help us kind of redefine what a proof of concept should look like and what is your intention of why you did what you did? Yeah, so um, we almost treated it like it was gonna happen, like it, this was the real deal. So um, what we did is we, whoever wanted to participate had to submit a use case. They had to tell us what business problem they were trying to solve, how they were gonna measure success, and then that's how we allowed them into, into the pilot. In addition, as I mentioned before, we had came up with a full marketing campaign for the pilot. We actually um, started to build governance through the pilot. We started to do build processes around curation. And again, uh, you know, tested some of the ideas we had around technology and how we could leverage that to, to really make this work. So we were very intentional about it. And uh, it was interesting because the, the entire ops team wanted in. And yeah. Like one, we don't have the licenses to do that, but two, um, not all of them had a case to use it. They just th saw it as the bright, shiny object. So. Um, I thought that was fantastic. I mean, uh, I don't, uh, I'll just talk about it. I can't <laughs> overestimate, I mean, how valuable those use cases were the business cases people brought to you and said, I have a business problem to solve. Let's go tackle, let's go tackle that. I don't know if you did here. Sorry, guys. Um, we good? Oh, perfect. Um, so I'm double mic'd. Uh, so with, <laughs> now I think what I was going to say. Um, so the intentionality behind the business case, super valuable because it set the stage for how and why Degreed was going to impact the business from the get-go and why learning was a part of your organizational strategy. So the other part that was intentional, you started to touch, about, touch on this, was how you started reskilling your team in the proof of concept or in the pilot. So you were highly intentional. You talked about your curators. Uh, let's double click into those guys real quick because you had a bunch of, you know, uh, curation, or not curation, uh, instructional designers all over the place. You said, you're now a curator, go. Um, how did you guys handle that? Yeah, so it was interesting. Um, I have two, two people that are uh, curators on my team. Before, one was an instructional designer and the other one was more of a program manager. Um, and so it was interesting to have that. I had to sell it to them to say, this is the way of the future. This is where things are going. And it was a little nerve-wracking at first, you know, to, if they were going to like it or not, but, but they both really dug in and loved it. And what we found is that, um, one, we were never going to be able to do this on our own as uh, one organization. So we took the approach where we're building a process and training for the rest of the L&D ecosystem. Um, so we built this curation pathway. People are going to go through the pathway and then they'll have to actually build a pathway with us and we'll handhold them. And once they get through that process, they'll be kind of rubber stamped that they can start to go ahead and build, uh, build pathways. Now, from, from Cisco's perspective, we're gonna start with more governance and over time would love to get to that, you know, the crowdsourcing model where people are able to create their own pathways. But we're, at first, we wanna get high quality pathways in there that have been created by, you know, well-trained curators. Yeah. And I think it's interesting. I mean, you guys have done some curation workshops already. I mean, 50, 60 people across the organization going through workshops on curation, being very intentional to say, we're, we're not going to ask you to do this without helping you get there. Um, staying on the team a little bit, I mean, obviously the software developers as learning organizations, I'd love to see how many other people have software developers on your L&D team. Is anybody else? I'm just curious. Oh, like one hand. I think two hands. It's fantastic. Um, 
So for everyone else in the, in the, in that's you know, like, yeah, like us that were leading teams that didn't have the luxury of two software engineers on your team, what are some things that you, know, you can recommend in terms of maybe ways we approach uh, you know, our, you know, these kind of implementations? And then also, how do you build the case to say, I need software engineers on my L&D team? Yeah, so with the, the first part, I think we as L&D professionals need to drink some of our own champagne or sparkling wine since I'm in California. So um, we need to reskill our teams. We need to, I mean, we've, this whole conference is based on, you know, skills. And we need to, need to do that. So that's what we're committed to do at Cisco is reskilling. Now, and with software developers, that is, that's a tougher one. But I mean, curators, marketing manager, et cetera, I think that's more doable. With the software, how to, to build a business case, um, it's, it's really easy once they see what has been done. And now, because they just built this, they have a, like a, a long list of projects now. Like, okay, you know, now that you did this, can you take stuff from our skills system and automatically be able to push that into the degree profile? And so it's just by seeing the, the, the fruits of their labor and what they've been able to do so quickly, um, it's, it's almost, you don't even have to have a business case. It's just, it's there in the product that they built. So, I, I mean, you just mentioned this, like, how do you, you get, you have these software developers, you have these high-end marketing team members, you've got brand new UX designers. As a, as a learning professional, how do you keep them busy, right? You've launched a green, like, is there enough, is there enough to have this kind of a high power team? I mean, and, and what do you, what do you do with them when you're done with uh, this one launch? Well, again, because things have, are changing where they have access to all this high quality content, there's new stuff that needs to be done. Like I said, in uh, just an example, it's not necessarily associated with Degreed, but we're um, building these, what are called leader learning labs. Um, and they're, you know, they can be all sorts of things. They're like 90 minute events that can, uh, that can be virtually, like for example, we just, did one on talent, a talent lab, and we leveraged like shoots and ladders where people can, I mean, it's bizarre that no, I mean, it's like interesting at the same time. So you need people that are able to think differently, be able to do things differently. And that's why I think it's so useful to have like the people that are outside the L&D domain come in from marketing, UX, software, because I think their ideas are really good and make a lot of sense. In, in learning right now. Yeah, it's, you know, you said you had the, the marketing team, you bring them in outside different mindset. You mentioned, uh, I thought this was interesting. You built this, I mean, what, when Josh talks about like we built a, a, dinner, a, a launch campaign strategy that they threw away, I mean, this thing was, it wasn't just an email. Like he really undersold this. It's, it was fantastic. Um, I mean, they had beautiful designs and imagery and digital signage and all sorts of stuff about limitless learning, really driving a message. And then, like you said, you threw it all away. So, I mean, for, for like learning folks, we build stuff and we want to hold on to it for years because it's like your baby, right? And right. marketers are used to this mindset of, I build it, I throw it away, I build a new one, I throw it away, I keep trying. Uh, how do you get, I mean, you bring, you said you bring people in from the outside. How do you build that adoption mindset within your team? I mean, what has been the challenge to say, hey guys, it's fine, we'll build stuff and we'll throw it away and we'll, we'll try again? Uh, tr trust, I would say, trusting the, you know, I'm not an expert in marketing, um, so I really lean on them to come up with what they think is best and, and setting, it's really a matter of trust. Sure. And so, again, you can't trust them immediately to, because you have to see what they're able to do, but I had seen what they'd done and I was excited to work with them. So, yeah, I think it's all about trust. Okay, here, I'll ask one more. Is, uh, you guys wanna ask, uh, have some questions? I'd love to hear from you guys as well. But you just mentioned the trust and, and within your team, I mean, as you make this shift, you're, you're really challenging the whole status quo of what learning teams have been known for, what they build, the, the delivery. I mean, you're talking, I'm talking starting with the business strategy, I'm delivering software, I'm delivering marketing campaigns with data. Um, how do you bring the rest of your organization along with you? I mean, how do you convince them that we're for real, uh, we can keep doing this, and this is how we're doing business differently, and get them, because you need them to participate just as much as you need your team to buy in. Yeah, I think it's, it's it's a journey because we've been doing a lot of work around in 
in conjunction with the Degreed project, simultaneously have been doing some work because we see where this is going to lead once we launch it. Um, so in the background, from a cross-functional L&D perspective, we've been working on what is the model of the future look like. Sure. And uh, it's not perfect. Not everyone is bought in yet. And uh, at Cisco, everything doesn't move as fast as I want it. But I think, I think we're making good headway. Nobody else has that problem. Um, <laughs> So I, I want to, I have plenty of, I, I could talk to you for days, uh, but I want to make sure to give some time to answer questions for anybody else. I mean, I think uh, it would be great to get uh, your thoughts. So I know we've got one up here. Um. Hey, um, Vic Akasale from DC. My question was around the fact that, you know, the, um, process of your business units coming to you with use cases, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's really powerful because at the end of the day, you get a lot of ideas that are kind of good, kind of great. Uh. But my question is, how did you inform them enough to know um, how to present a business cases? So kind of what, what pre-communication did you have to do so that they knew enough about the platform yeah. to say, oh, I think I can do this? So that's the question. Yeah, so um, what we did is a couple things. One is we had like a, a kickoff to the project where we um, gave an overview to, it was like uh, many of the L&D leaders, a lot of the client-facing team that work closely with the business. And so it was really incumbent on them to take the message back out because my team is fairly small, so I can't reach all the business as well as they can. So we had like a kickoff workshop where we went through what Degreed is, how it works, and, and all the benefits and such, which Casey was a part of. And really then they took that message back and came forth with uh, you know ideas. Hey, we want to do this, we want to do that. Um, so that's really... I would say the main way we did it. And the good thing is, is that our client facing and L&D folks have really good relationships with the business already in most cases. And so uh, it wasn't too difficult to have that connection. And go ahead. Um, we got one here in the middle if you guys have a mic. Uh, I would just add to that um, while you're finding the mic runner. I mean, that kickoff was, um, you know, a couple of weeks into the project, but there were 65 or 70 people on this call. I mean, it was a, it was a big group of people, so reached out, reached out to a lot of people and did that. Hi, I'm Sue Hingle with Regions Bank in Alabama. I'm curious, you said you launched uh, in two weeks, October 16th, yep. officially? Okay, fast forward a year from now, what do you want to be saying about the relationship, the work, the accomplishments? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, Really, for me, it's, it's really about have the employees started to build that new muscle? Um, have they started to use uh, Degreed on a daily basis? Have they, um, are we seeing the data that supports our theory that people are learning outside of the LMS? And the pilot data that we've uh, gathered thus far is showing that that is happening in that direction. But it's really looking at the data and trying to, again, what we're focusing on at, uh, at Cisco is we really want this as a career enabler. And so um, starting off with development, but over time looking at roles and skills, et cetera. Um, so for me, one year out, I would love to see, come back and be able to tell a story about how people have really bought into and made some steps towards that mind shift. So that's, that's probably what I would want to talk about the next time around. Hey, Bill Beagle from Verizon. So um, you, you mentioned folks seeing the shiny new toy. Um, yeah. <laughs> and being in the technology team, we, we deal with that a lot uh, in L&D. Uh, my question is, how, how did you kind of help uh, kind of vet through all those use cases? Any insight into kind of the selection criteria, kind of paring that down, um, you know, factoring in potentially even beyond just the business case, what other factors, you know, people's excitement, et cetera, did you look at? Yeah, so it was kind of uh, twofold. So we had, the, we had the business use cases, and I'll talk about that in a second. 
And then we had our own internal stuff that we wanted to test out, like, hey, can it integrate with this? Um, does this work? So there was some L&D related use cases that we had that we were gonna test no matter what. So in terms of like figuring out what was the right business case, to, it, what we did basically is we identified like what were, what did we believe were the main use cases? And so the categories like, like ops, they wanted to, they had this idea around uh, a certain skill set that everyone in ops needed to have by 2020. So they said, we wanna build pathways, foundational pathways around each of these key skill areas. And so for us, that's like a no brainer. That's a, a use case where that degree can help solve. So I would say the criteria were, uh, was that, is it one of the common use cases we identified? Can it be solved by degree? And I would say those would be the two things we looked at. Um, and we got a lot, again, a lot of them were around that kind of pathway, building uh, a skills-based curriculum, um, but there were others as well. Josh, while you're hitting the next question, is it fair to, I mean, say you guys sort of did this with your scope as well. You, you were limited to about 10,000 people is about what you targeted. Um, so you sort of selected some of those business units up front with areas where you thought you might get some success to help you have early success as well. Yes, there were, there were certain people that raised, like IT was one of them that was very, uh, once they heard about degree, they were calling me incessantly that they wanted to be part. Uh, and the CIO was, uh, wanted his whole organization to be on this new system. So, yeah. Other questions? So, I mean, one of the things I, uh, I think is interesting, now you're making this shift, um, and you, you go from, you know, this proof of concept, you've, you've played it out, um, and now you're in this phase of, all right, I'm gonna go to a global audience, 85,000 people, uh, multiple languages, ready, set, go. Um, has there been anything out of the proof of concept that you would say, we, you know, going through this by having this, this, and this, uh, made help me make this business case to make this not easy for people to go oh, that sounds like a good idea but to say I need this we're excited to do this I mean what were some of those things you learned in this period that helped you move to the next phase with a lot of confidence that you have yeah I, um, I would say there's a couple things I think having the actual use cases and being able to show that they did what they were supposed to do was was very helpful in addition, any kind of, um, through the work we did with IT, um, they really became a champion. So again, I've heard a lot of people talk about champions this week, and I think it's super important that you find champions within the business because they do a better job of selling it than I could ever do. Um, so that was another key piece that um, helped us. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I mean, those are the, I, I think that's the main thing. Rob's gonna get a workout in. <laughs> Hi, uh, Enid Crystal from BlackRock. Um, just curious to know when you can, when you switched over the roles on your team. You know, you talk about upskilling, reskilling, etc. Did you? Is it the same people who had to learn new skills, or did you go outside and like have to have to get it, a combination? So um, I think. Some of the L&D skills are more transferable than others. So like an instructional designer, curriculum manager, curation isn't too far of a stretch for them. But for things like UX design and software development, it's a little bit harder, but we're more than willing if people are interested and um, interested to learn and have a lot of energy around it, we'll definitely look at um, you know retraining people to be learning experience designers, but we did have to, and we are looking outside right now for, for those type of people. And they're difficult to find, just FYI, so. Hi, uh, Kristen Brochu from Prudential. Um, how did you get your leaders to become more engaged with the tools so that they could then model that behavior for their teams? You know what, it's, uh, I didn't have to do too much. 
Um, I think I think some of it has to do with, and you guys can tell me if this is true or not. There's some people within the organization that have more of a learning a bent toward learning. You know, they they get it, um, and those people are usually the first ones to stand up and say, "Yes, we want to do this." So it was. I think it was less about me selling it and more about targeting those business leaders that were already uh, partial to learning and learning was important to them. So I think that's the key thing is finding those friendlies that already get the power of learning and how transform transformational it can be in targeting them. So that's what we did. I think we have time for maybe one more question. You guys want? Up here in the front. Hey, uh, just curious if uh, you have plans to kind of engage some of your subject matter experts to be, you know, out there and sharing great content and what, what's your strategy around that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, um, so some of the pathways that have already been built were built in conjunction with subject matter experts. So we built a machine learning pathway, the engineering learning and development team built a machine learning pathway with all some of our key machine learning SMEs across the business. Now, this, that was like, again, we're gonna start with the big governance. Over time, we'd like to get to a point where it's everyone in the organization is creating pathways and we're able to kind of bubble up what the best ones are. Um, but for any of the pathways we're gonna build starting off, we're definitely going to be, um, working in conjunction with subject matter experts to do that. But again, I'd like to get to that and I'd be interested to talk with anyone after, the, after this discussion to see how they've been able to implement that more crowdsourcing method of just allowing all the things to bubble up. I think Booz Allen or um, another company, they were talking about that. But for now, we're gonna say, these are the key pathways we want people to take and push them out to the right appropriate audiences. Because one of the challenges at Cisco right now is we just have too much stuff. And people don't know where to go and what stuff to use. So we're just kind of like, it's a blank slate for us, so we're trying to start slow. Thanks. So Josh, I mean, I one, I want to thank you for, for this and, and uh, sure. your, your presentation. Uh, as we kind of wrap up, anything, you know, as you think about you know, the way that Cisco's changing or the way, you know, things you're doing, anything else you would like to kind of leave us with as a, as a team? Yeah, so I would say just in summary, first, thanks for, thanks for your partnership, appreciate it. Um, I think the key thing is, one, to, to start with a strategy. Um, I didn't talk too much about our own learning and development strategy for the company, but we've built it, we've stuck with it, um, and we try to align all our initiatives around it. So that's what I would say first and foremost, start with that strategy. Second is, again, I know everyone doesn't have the uh, ability to have a software developer or hire or UX designers, um, but start small, you know. Take someone on your team and take a portion of their time and start moving it into a new area. Um, and if you have the ability to bring in new people and new perspectives, I think that's awesome. Um, and finally, with technology, I think just become you know, curious and learn more about it and understand how it's changing the way we learn and, and tinker and, and, and embrace it. So those would be the key things that I would say, Casey. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, uh, thanks, Josh. I, this was uh, this was fantastic. Uh, actually, I'll start by giving you a round of applause. Guys, want to thank you very much.